Hello everyone and welcome to a digital walk in the footsteps of the Franciscans, an online tour of Gorton Monastery. My name is Emma Browning and I'm the Heritage and Community Impact Manager at Gorton Monastery. This tour is completely digital. To create this I've actually used the Headbox Explore 3D software on our website and then I've screen captured this on my computer and then added audio on top. So we're now just going to slow transition into the Headbox 3D mapping software uh, that we use. Many of you will recognise this if you've been before. It's the outside, the front entrance of the monastery building. Uh, you'll notice for those that you haven't been that we have a really large car park uh, for when you want to come in the future. Now we're just going to go head straight in through those front doors into the welcome wing. You can see this is the map of the building so you can just see it from a bird's eye view and now we're at the front of the welcome wing. So the Welcome Wing was built in 2016 as part of a Heritage Lottery funded project. It's a really contemporary area of the building. You can just see the pedestrian entrance at the moment there. And we'll have a look back towards the front doors as well. And it was on the footprints of the original front wing of the Friary. that was demolished in the mid 70s. So it's really contemporary looking. It's got a cafe at the back, uh, which isn't set up in this image, but it's just over here. Which there that would be, that's our Welcome Wing Cafe. And then usually on an open day, this area here, just in front of the Welcome Desk, would be our little pop-up shop that you can see there all around that area. And then this is the back, this is the Welcome Desk. So if you came for a physical tour, this is where you'd head to to begin. You'd meet the tour guide, uh, they'd probably take your lunch order if you're on the Taste of the Monastery Tour. And then as a group, we'd head into the Friary area to begin the tour. That's just where we're going now. And just so you can see for access issues, if you come, uh, the loos are just there. Um, this software is really good not only to give you a glimpse into the monastery, but if you do have access issues, it can show you what it would be like when you came uh, physically. Just here, we're having a look at where the lift is and the stairs up to the first and second floor. And now we'll begin the proper tour with lots of historical info. So the story of the monastery begins in November 1861, when a group of Franciscan friars arrived to Gorton by rail with the aim of establishing a parish and building a friary there. Uh, the site where the monastery was to be built was Bankfield Cottage and was surrounded by approximately four and a half acres of land and was just off of Old Gorton Lane. Looking from Bankfield Cottage, the Franciscans would have seen the nearby town of Gorton, which was inhabited by about 3,000 people, predominantly engaged in the agriculture at Cotton and the emerging engineering industries. This image here shows Edward Welby Pugin, who was the 24-year-old architect, who we'll talk about later, and this is Brother Patrick Dalton, who was the clerk of works on one of the friars. Built in stages between 1863 and 1872, the east side of the friary wing was first, followed by other wings, and finally the church. It's interesting to note that the spire wasn't actually added until the 50th anniversary of the friars' arrival in 1911. Now, between 1872 and the 1960s is what we consider to be the heyday of Gorton Monastery. It served the needs of the local people, providing schools, a parish hall, youth clubs, a theatre, music groups, brass bands, and became both a spiritual and social focus for the local community and a centre of social life. For example, about 1,300 people walked on Whit Friday in 1895, and there were about 6,000 parishioners in 1901, showing you just how busy this site really was. The friary also functioned as a Franciscan training centre and sometimes there were so many friars on site that they couldn't all live there. Some of them had to live on a different street that at the time was nicknamed Holy Lane because there were so many of them there. You may notice on the bottom right hand image uh, there were only six friars there. They were the final six friars in the late 1980s and that's when things were getting really difficult and what we're going to talk about next. What I've just pointed out to you there is our old pantry where you can have afternoon tea. Um, you can choose to have it in the welcome wing, in the pantry or in our garden. And now we're going to walk around to one of the other exhibition panels, which tells the more troubling history of the building. So what I'm just going to point you out to you in a second uh, is some of the dereliction that happened in the building in the 1990s. And I'll talk about why that happened. Now, I'm just about to show you this image here, uh, which shows where the roof collapsed in and that... Uh, it collapsed all the way from the roof through the second floor through the first floor into the basement and that room is just there where all that damage happened 
So the question you may have then is how did the monastery fall into decline? Well, in the 1960s and 70s, uh, there was a redevelopment of the local area and as a result, a demolition of many of the surrounding terraced houses. This led to a relocation of the population and as a result, dwindling church numbers. By the late 1980s, decline in church attendance meant that less money was coming in to church collections and as a result, they were struggling to carry out all their maintenance work. And by 1989, only six elderly friars remained to look after the site. So unable to maintain the site, the Franciscans decided to leave it. They had the last mass on the 26th of November 1989. And then sadly, it was sold to a property developer who was going to convert the site into a series of flats. The developer sought and was granted planning permission. But in 1993, the flat scheme failed and the building was left in completely abandoned and open to vandalism. The church and friar were left unprotected, vandals destroyed the altars, anything left of value was stolen, including lead and marble. Uh, the lead plate was taken off the friary roof, leading to severe water damage, and there's also evidence of fires occurring on site. By 1996, the monastery was in a really bad state. But it was that year, 1996, after seeing the derelict state of the monastery when travelling to Manchester, Paul Griffiths, a former altar boy and St Francis pupil, and his wife Elaine Griffiths founded the Monastery of St Francis and Gorton Trust as a building preservation trust with the aim of trying to save this site. They recruited trustees and an army of volunteers and began to carry out feasibility works looking into how to save the site. Now it took years in order to be able to save this building, it was a really, really difficult process and included three heritage lottery bids, but by the early 2000s they were finally granted the money from the heritage lottery fund. In total it took 300 people 609 days to actually do the restoration work on the building and it was one of the biggest community-led restoration projects to be completed in the country at the time. Over 100 miles worth of scaffolding tubes were erected, enough to stretch end on end from the monastery to Hadrian's Wall. Since its restoration, the monastery has functioned as an events venue. 100% of the building's revenue funding comes from the site itself, as it hosts conferences, private dinners, awards dinners, meetings and weddings. Alongside this, it's also open to the public for talks, tours, family fun days, health and wellbeing days, community meetings and also for our general visitor programme. We're now going to go back to our 3D mapping software in the Friary. I'll tell you a little bit more information there before we then digitally head on into the nave. Now in 2013, there was a really special day when Her Majesty the Queen and His Royal Highness the Duke of Edinburgh paid a private visit to the monastery. Now, every time there's a royal visit on site, it's really, really special, especially because it also brings the attention of the press, the work that is being done here at the monastery. With this board here, it talks about Sir Gerald Kaufman, who is a British politician and served as Member of Parliament from 1970 until his death in 2017, for Manchester Ardwick and then Manchester Gorton. Um, he was really, really supportive of the monastery, particularly in its early years during the Restoration period. Now, before we go into the nave, I'm just finally going to talk a little bit about the Pugins. Now, it was Edward Welby Pugin, who was the architect here, who designed the church and Franciscan friary. Now, he was only 24 when he arrived, but he really did come from an architectural dynasty. His grandfather was August Charles Pugin, who was a draftsman for John Nash. And then his father was Augustus Welby Northmore Pugin, who was known for helping to design the Palace of Westminster, the House of Parliament, alongside the classical architect, Sir Charles Barry after the fire of 1834. After Augustus' death, Edward inherited his father's practice and eventually formed the Pugin and Pugin practice alongside his half-brother Peter Paul Pugin. Now it's important to note that Gorton Monastery really was a Pugin project. Not only did Edward design the church and friary here, but it was also Peter who designed a lot of the stonework, including the high altar. Now we're just going to have a look back at the welcoming, so you can see we've already gone all the way around the friary. And now we're heading into the nave. Now the reason we call it the nave is because that's the central part of the church. It comes from the Latin word navis for ship. This is possibly a connection to Noah's Ark or to St Peter's ship. St Peter was the first pope and he was also a fisherman who became one of the twelve apostles. Now one thing you'll notice when you come into the building is just how tall the nave actually is. It is the height of many cathedrals. You can see just how far it goes up. Now this was a feature of New Gothic or Gothic Revival architecture that the Pugins were in favour of. The idea being that you would come into the room and you would look upwards towards the skies and then directly towards God. Now you'll also notice that I'm pointing out here the different statues. These are 12 statues of saints on the pillars here. 
Now they have a really interesting story. I'm not going to cover them today, but I really do encourage you to come visit us so you can learn about these really, really interesting stories around the site. Now you'll notice that I'm pointing at these doors all the way go along the nave. Uh, if you want to take a guess in your heads what you think they might be, um, these are actually the confessionals. Now the reason they had so many doors was not because the historic population of Gorton were particularly naughty. Um, in 1901 they did have around 6,000 parishioners coming in per week, but actually because the friar would be in the middle and then he could talk to someone either on the left or right, thus hurrying up and quickening the queue. Now you'll notice here that I'm pointing at a mosaic. It shows the original height of the floor. Um, it's a mosaic which shows the Franciscan uh, symbol of Jesus Christ and St Francis both receiving the stigmata. And then it says Deus meus et omnia, which is a Francisco motto, meaning my God and my all. It's really, really special that we still have it. Now up here, I'm just going to point to uh, where the organ used to be. We're going to go back so we can get a little bit of a better look. Now, unfortunately, though lots of items have been preserved, like we've got the statues of the saints and we've still got the, mo uh, the mosaic, unfortunately, some items have been lost and the organ is included within that. Now, there used to be a really, really beautiful organ up there at the organ loft. It was designed by a company in Rochdale called Wadsworth Brothers, um, but sadly, during the dereliction period, it was taken apart piece by piece and sold for scrap metal. Um, so we don't have that anymore, sadly. Something else that I'm going to show you here is where the doors used to be. So there used to be two doors on either side, rotating doors at the end. Um, and these used to be the original entrance into the site if people wouldn't come into the friary, they'd come in straight to the church. Now I'm also pointing out these pegs that you can see along here. You might want to have a take a guess what they used to be for. So these used to hold the stations of the cross and they were all round on either side of the nave. Sadly, we don't have those anymore either. So there are some objects that we just don't have, um, but we're very lucky what we have managed uh, to maintain in the building. Now, one of these items is that of the Reredos, which we're going to go and have a look at now. We're just going to glide over these tables here. So this structure at the back, this large stone structure is called the Reredos, and the high altar would have been just in front of that. Sadly, the marble was taken off the high altar during the dereliction period. Now on a much more positive note, you'll notice the stained glass windows behind. These are really, really beautiful. They're a reason I'd employ you to come and just have a look at these. Um, and they actually show the story of the St Francis in the middle. Now 90% of those stained glass windows are original, which is really, really special. Now on the left hand side of the high altar and the rare dust where I'm pointing here, this is where the lady altar is. Um, unfortunately, I can't show it you today as much as I'd like to, just because the software didn't go far enough that way for me to do so. Now, during a 2016 HLF restoration project, some conservatives were in. What I'm pointing at here is that they took off some tiny, tiny paint flakes to be able to reveal previous paint schemes underneath. Now, we're just going to head over to the right hand side of the high altar to show you the crucifix, and it weighs about 350 kilograms. Now, the crucifix used to hang above the high altar from chains, but during that 2016 restoration project, the decision was taken to put it on the right hand side. That means that we can see it much closer up. It also means that if there's any issues with conservation or restoration work to it, it's much easier to access and also to maintain it for the future. Now we're just heading back along the Friary Cloisters so that we can go out into the garden for the end point of the tour because when it was recorded, it was a really, really lovely day. So that's the door we would have come through that I was just pointing at over there. We're currently at the Welcome Wing side. Just over here, we've got um, a really lovely area dedicated to Tony Hurley, who is the original tour director. A lot of the research that our tours and talks are based on, including this one, was that of Tony Hurley's. Um, and he also wrote Beggars and Builders, um, his story of Gorton Monastery, uh, which has loads and loads of information about the building and its history. Now I'm just pointing here at the apse, which is on the left hand side on the west wing of the friary. And then this is the east wing of the friary over here which goes into our new uh, welcome wing and the new block. You can see it just here, this is the original wall. And then you'll see inside, this is the gate here, which says St Francis Friary Gorton. So you'll have noticed throughout this talk and when you come into the building, we often interchange between calling it a friary and a monastery. And something doesn't quite add up and make sense there. That's because it never actually was a monastery. This was always a church and Franciscan friary. 
So how did that happen? Well, when the fires arrived in the 1860s, the local Victorian population of Gorton, they didn't know the difference between a friar and a monk, so they just assumed that these men, dressed in their long habits, were monks, and as a result, it was nicknamed Gorton Monastery.